I just finished the manuscript of a book that I will be sending to the publisher this week. What is going to happen when Jesus returns? Today, the question I'd like to ask and answer is what it, is it going to be like for you? Those of you sitting here, including myself, and those listening to this, what will it be like for us when Jesus returns? Have you ever thought about that? Let me try to explain. Obviously, for different people, it may be slightly differently. But, for those my age or thereabouts, or a little older, chances are, at that point in time, at that moment in history, we could be lying in a grave somewhere, with our eyes closed, having been dead for a while. Now, I know nobody looks forward to that, but death and taxes comes to all men. And imagine, you're lying there, your eyes are closed, and the first thing you hear is a sound. It's the sound of a trumpet. A trumpet blowing, getting louder and louder, followed by a shout, and suddenly you open your eyes and you realize that you are alive. You know you're alive because all the aches and pains, some of which you carried for years, are gone. You're not only alive, you are vibrantly alive, energetically alive. You seem to have more energy than you ever had in all of your entire life. And then you seem to rise. And you look around and you realize that you have arisen out of a grave. And you may hear a voice behind you saying, come with me. And you may remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 23. I mean, Matthew 24, verse 31 where Jesus was talking, and he said, He that is God shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So the angels are sent out, and the angels are sent out to gather you, because you've got a journey to make. Not a journey to heaven, surprisingly but a journey across the earth. You may be heading east. If you were buried in America, chances are you'd be heading east. If you were buried in Europe, you'd be heading south. If you were buried over in Australia, you'd be heading west. If you were buried in South Africa or Africa, you'd be heading north. Why? Because when Jesus returns, he's not coming back to New York, or Sydney, or Berlin, or Johannesburg, South Africa. He's coming back to Jerusalem. So we got to meet him somewhere above Jerusalem. Because if you remember the ascension of Jesus that we read about in Acts, the first chapter, Jesus was standing on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And it says, as they were looking at him, he ascended, and a cloud received them out of their sight. And two angels came and said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up to heaven? The same Jesus is going to come back the same way. That's where he's going to land. But he's not just going to zoom down and land. He's going to come, and we're going to meet him in the air. 
That's what the Apostle Paul said in First, First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Let's turn there and read it. First Thessalonians 4, because the Apostle Paul said we should not be ignorant. <laughs> That's quite a statement. Ignorant. I read in the book of Daniel this morning that knowledge shall be increased. No, I didn't read it directly. I was listening to one of Mr. Dart's tapes, and he read it in the book of Daniel about knowledge shall be increased. It was such a good message. Yes, I've forgotten what scripture I was looking for. First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Yes, knowledge has been increased in this world of ours, but a lot of people are ignorant of some of the very important things of the scriptures. First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. The apostle Paul wrote, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's where we're going to meet him. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Are we going to stay up there? No, the story's not finished. The story's not finished. Jesus is coming back to the earth. We're going to meet him. The angels are going to gather us, and we're going to meet him. Where? In the air. What's it going to be like? You get there, maybe on the way there, you see others who are heading there. Those of us who have kept the festivals of God for many, many years, have you, you remember a time you went to keep the Feast of Tabernacles somewhere a long distance away, and you know, you stop at a gas station and you meet somebody who just looked like they were going to the feast. And you may never have met them before. And so you start talking, and you find out they're going to the same feast site you are. It's kind of joyous. Other times you see somebody you haven't seen for years, and they're going the same place you're going. That's what it's going to be like as we head toward the meeting place with Jesus Christ. And we'll see some of our old friends died a long time ago. How joyous, how exciting will that be? Maybe a parent, maybe a brother, maybe a sister. It's going to happen. This is real. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is what I'm looking forward to. I hope you are. I hope you're ready for it. If you're not, I hope you're getting ready for it, because it's going to come. To say it's not going to come is saying, I'm never going to die. What chance is there of that happening? <laughs> Just hold your breath, see how long you can go. The trumpet will sound, and we will be raised. Those still alive on earth at that time, who have totally committed their lives to God, truly converted Christians, will be changed. We've got a lot of young people in the Church of God. I gave this sermon, or a similar sermon, they'll never come out the same in another church down south of Waco, and that's a congregation of mostly young people with little children. And I said to them, I hope you're ready for that time, because when that time draws near, you'll know it's drawing near. Oh, we won't know the exact time, but you'll know. You'll be able to say to your children, well, one of these days, Jesus is going to come back. And when he comes back, we're going to go and meet him. What about us? Little kiddies may say, like my grandkids. What about us? I said, you don't have to worry. God will send out his angels. There are millions of angels. 
God will send an angel to take care of you for that day, just that day. And a mother and father will be able to say, Bye-bye, kids. You just stay here with Angelica. I think it's a good name for an angel. <laughs> Angelica. <laughs> you stay here with Angelica. Somebody's going to write and say, There's no angel called Angelica. <laughs> well, not in the Bible. I just made that up. It's kind of cute. Maybe one day some angel will come to me. Hey, that was my name. No, Angelica comes from angel. Could be Angeline. Could be whatever. God will take care of the children as the parents go to meet <clears throat> the one they've waited to meet, Jesus. And when we get there, imagine the scene. I don't know how many they're going to be. Quite a few thousand. Some we may kind of recognize because we've read their stories, or maybe they're introduced to us, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, and Enoch, and Noah, and the apostles, Peter, and John, and Andrew, and Bartholomew, and the rest of them, and Matthew, and the apostle Paul. And then you recognize others who you look at and you, you're surprised to see them there. Just like some people will look at you and will be surprised to see you there. Like say, you? Yeah, I made it. By the grace of God, through the mercy of Jesus Christ and His blood cleansing me, that's why I'm here. And a lot of people hearing that would say amen to that. Because there's no way we're going to get there on our own steam. Only by the grace of God. And then we'll meet the one that chances are most of us will not recognize him. There will be others there who recognize him immediately. Abraham will recognize the one who became Jesus Christ immediately. Why? Because that was his friend. They ate together. They spent lots of time together. Jacob will remember him. Oh, yeah, remember the wrestling match we had? Noah will remember him because God spoke to Moses, Noah directly. They had a personal relationship with him. We ought to have a personal relationship with him even though we don't see him. A lot of Christians will be surprised when they see Jesus. I can tell you by the time Jesus appears above Jerusalem, many people will think that's not him. They've been so deceived that they will be surprised when they see the real Jesus. But we'll realize who he is because he'll come to us and say, I am Jesus. I'm your Savior. And chances are we'll fall down and hold his feet like Mary did after his resurrection. She wanted to do that, and then he said, Touch me not. And later on, the disciples came and held his feet and his hands. Do we think about these things? This is what is going to happen. This is not just a fairy tale. This is real. This is the future for us. Every day we get older, the closer we get to it. Every year we get older, the closer we get to it. The return of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Revelation 11. <clears throat> Revelation 11. And verse 15. Revelation explains a lot of things which you have to fit into the story flow. You have all kinds of wars and frightful things that will strike the earth that you read about in chapter 8 and chapter 9. Trumpets blowing one after the other, one horrible thing after the other, one thing following the other, wars like we've never seen before. 
So many preachers like to say, oh, we've got to look for this and look for this and look for this. Yes, we've got to be watchful. We've got to be aware of what's happening, but not jump to every kind of conclusion that people like to jump to. I also finished a book on the book of Revelation, how to understand the book of Revelation. Number one lesson, how to understand the book of Revelation. Read it for what it says. Read it word for word and say, what is it telling me? John saw things and God said to him, write it down. Write down what you see. So John wrote down what he saw. Why? So that when the people who see those things will say, that's what he saw. And many of the things he saw, we don't see yet. Jesus talked about a time of great tribulation. Can you look out the window and see a great tribulation right now? You must be kidding. However, if you go down to the Congo or to some of these countries facing the Ebola virus, where they've just been faced with years of years of war and famines and pestilence of all kinds, you talk to them about Great Tribulation, they'll say, we've had it for a long time. Well, we know the whole world's going to end up like that. But I don't like it when preachers jump on this event or that event. Oh, this is it. That's it. This is it. No, it's not. It's not. Mr. Dart in his tape mentioned the king of the north and king of the south. And I couldn't help but think how many kings of the north I've heard identified. Every person in the Middle East that causes some kind of a rumpus, he's the king of the north or he's the king of the south. <laughs> the Bible's actually very simple. If you're standing in Jerusalem and you look south, that's where you look for the king of the south. And if you turn around and you look north, that's where you look for the king of the north. Now, Iran is neither north or south. It's east. Iraq, where King Hussein was, not King Hussein, Saddam Hussein, at one time was proclaimed by a whole bunch of evangelicals here in the United States as the great danger to the world. And some called him the king of the south. And I thought they never looked at the map. Because if you stood in Jerusalem and you looked where King I mean, Saddam Hussein was, he was in the north. Now, of course, he's gone. They found him in a hole in the ground. You know the story. Oh, then Assad over in Syria came to power. He had poison weapons and poison gas and whatever. Oh, this is the king of the south. If you stood in Jerusalem and you wanted to look at Syria, where's that? It's north. <laughs> Why call it the king of the south? Is it the true king of the north that's finally going to come down to Jerusalem? You imagine Assad trying to head down to Jerusalem with the Israeli army waiting for him. That's not going to happen. No, the things when they do happen will be so frightening, so big, so dramatic, and so quick that the world will be staggered. And a lot of people will go through that. But we get to Revelation 11, Verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Here's the seventh trumpet sounds. And what, I, what happens at the time of the seventh trumpet? The resurrection of the dead happens. This is the time, right? 
when the seventh trumpet sounds, when you have the resurrection of the dead, when we meet Christ in the air. Revelation 11, 15. Guess what? We're meeting Jesus in the air, and half the book is still to come. Right? Because we're going to have to have chapter 15 and 16 when the seven last plagues of God are poured out. And you can read them. You can take the time, read chapter 15 and 16 and read these plagues and it takes time to read through them. That's not how it's going to happen. You see, this is like a movie that goes for a long time, and then finally things speed up toward the last ten minutes of this two-hour movie, and then it just happens, wham, 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 wham. Jesus returns, we meet Jesus in the air, and while we are with Jesus in the air, we have the trumpet plagues poured out. And if you read them, it just happens one, next one, next one, the first one is poured out, Saws fall, falls on everybody. The second angel, verse 3. The sea becomes like blood. The third angel, verse 4. The waters become as blood. You can imagine this. People with sores and no fresh water. The fourth angel, verse 8. The sun starts scorching men with fire. Back in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 30, we... Read that the sun will become seven times hotter. Isaiah 24, it says, The earth will reel to and fro like a drunk man. Imagine the earth just kind of getting slightly off its, off its path around the sun. Just got a little, little closer. What will it be like? People won't know what happened. And then darkness. In verse 11 it says, And people blasphemed God because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. You know, deception is a terrible thing. Let me just spend a little bit of time there. Deception, because none of us think we're deceived. Deception is a terrible thing because a deceived person doesn't know he's deceived. Which means we could be deceived not know it. Here, God is intervening in world affairs. He's causing plagues to fall down on human beings, and they don't repent. Why? Because they're still deceived. Because at that point in time, you'll still have a great religious figure who would have moved his headquarters down to Jerusalem, as the Apostle Paul says, standing in the temple of God, saying, He is God, performing great miracles, backed up by a great big military power, and the world thinks this is good because they brought peace to the world. Before they bring chaos, Oh, it's easy for us as Christians to say, Oh, no, I won't be caught up with that stuff. I know better. I know the two witnesses of God. I'll follow them. I won't follow these other people. Oh, yeah. Imagine some powerful religious figure standing in Jerusalem with a powerful military person not appearing like Adolf Hitler. but appearing like an angel of righteousness, appearing like a lamb, it says, but speaking like a dragon, we can recognize that, but appearing like a lamb. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, if Satan himself appears like an angel of light, what do you think his ministers will be doing? So the world will see this. And then we have two witnesses, whoever they're going to be. Imagine two people 
in Jerusalem, appearing in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, hey, all this is wrong. You think that, oh, well, I'll know what's right now. No, deception is a bad thing. The first step in getting rid of deception is looking at yourself and saying, where am I wrong? Where am I wrong in my thinking? I've learned more by asking that question because I've studied this Bible for many, many, many years. And then things have happened. I've said, where were we wrong? And as soon as I asked that question, I see where I was wrong. Oh, wait a bit. I didn't get the whole picture back there. Let me fix it. So I learn every week. I learn something new. As we were driving here, my wife said to me, the psalm where it says, man lives 70 years. I said, yes, Psalm 90. She said, do you know who wrote that? I said, yes, it was Moses. You see, she thought she was going to catch me out. But I knew it was Moses, one of two psalms written by Moses, Psalm 90 and Psalm 91. Psalm 91 ties in with this sermon because Psalm 91 you read that 10,000 will die on your left and 1,000 on your right and won't come near you. It's a good scripture for those who will still be on earth at that time when all these troubles come and have a firm belief that God can protect them, that God can look after them. Wherever they may be, God can intervene for his people. He always has, and he can, and he will. Jesus said, watch and pray always, that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man, Luke 21, 36. These are real things. So when we meet Jesus in the air and all these plagues are poured out, We'll miss this part of the story because we'll be up there with him. You read the rest of these plagues poured out. The last one of the plagues poured out on the armies that gather at Armageddon. That's amazing where you find Armageddon in the Bible. Revelation 16. How many preachers have told you, watch out for Armageddon. Look for Armageddon. What's happening in the Middle East right now is leading to Armageddon. No. Armageddon comes much later. Where will you be when Armageddon happens? I'll tell you where I hope to be. With Jesus in the clouds. All these plagues here are poured out in one day. The armies gather up at Megiddo. And they move 80 miles south. That's how far Megiddo is from Jerusalem. And there Jesus destroys them. And we'll see those armies destroyed. We'll see, as it says in Revelation 19, the beast and the false prophet taken and thrown in the lake of fire. We'll see the Jews finally realizing, hey, this is the true Christ as they go fight with the Lord in Zechariah 14. We'll see some interesting things. We're in the clouds with Jesus, and that's the time when he's going to go back and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And suddenly all kinds of things will happen which I won't cover now, but be sure to be here when I speak on the Sabbath during the Feast of Tabernacles, because that's where we pick up this story, the most exciting time in your whole existence starts right there. The reason why God has called you into His truth. The reason why God called me away in South Africa and my wife over in Australia and all of you, wherever you were, when God first opened your eyes to the truth, the reason for that is for when we get together with Jesus Christ, 
and then descend toward the Mount of Olives to start our real job, our eternal job, our exciting, thrilling, unbelievable job of helping this poor earth come right. What is it going to be like for you? If you've repented, you've humbled yourself before God, or will repent, or continue to repent, and humble yourself before God, you will be with Jesus when he returns. It is going to be so thrilling. And we just celebrated the Feast of Trumpets. Pictures the return of Jesus. If you look at the festivals of God, the Feast of Trumpets is the middle feast. Just like I said, Revelation eleven fifteen, the trumpet sounds in the middle of the book. There's still the rest of the book to come. The same with the festivals. Feast of Trumpets, the middle feast. There's still some others to come exciting, thrilling times ahead of us. Let's rejoice in that and think about these wonderful things.